Success Mantra is a program which features people, successful individuals from various walks of life. They are less known heroes who believe in their dreams and have conviction to live their full potential. Idols, icons, innovators who care to live every moment on their own terms. Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Success Mantra. As always, we have someone really interesting, a man who claims he never gets bored. Really, this is actually going to be explored today. Professor with Delhi University, we have Devraj Mukherjee with us. And, uh, you know, it's a great delight uh, to have him on the show. Before we go ahead, uh, Rajada, we would love to understand a little about what you have been doing with your life. To make it so exciting that you don't get bored at all. Yeah, I don't think uh, <clears throat> excitement is extraneous to uh, uh, your mind or who you are. I think the real challenge in life is not to sort yourself outside, but to sort yourself within. Yeah? I mean, uh, in our minds, uh, we shape our futures, we shape our destinies. I mean, circumstances are important, opportunities are important, where you've gone to school, where you've gone to college, what degrees you've accumulated, these are important things. Yeah? But I think the real challenge is, is inside the head. And I think that journey for me is as exciting as my journey outside. So my outside journey has been in academics. I am now uh, uh, quite dyed in the wool in this profession. I've been teaching for more than 30 years. I, I love my job. Like I tell everybody, uh, I don't know I'm an ordinary human being, but once I'm inside the classroom, I find I feel like Sachin Tendulkar in the zone. So when, when, a, when, a, when, a, when a performer, whether an artist or a cricketer or a sports person, anybody, you know, when they're in their zone, they are in their elements. For me, uh, my greatest success is the classroom that I hold for one hour uh, every day, from time, three times a day. Every time that entire hour that I am inside the classroom teaching my students is the pinnacle of my external world. It's the pinnacle of my success. Because everything that I am has contributed to that hour. You know, it's an entire hour in the making. From the time I was a young child, I have become somebody who's able to hold that hour and make it his own. So my success is actually both a product of what's outside and what's inside. What's outside is that one hour that when I'm in the classroom, when I'm engaging with my students, that's what I'm meant to do. No more, no less. But in that one hour, I have uh, my impact quotient is high mm -hmm. from the feedback that I get. My students uh, find value in what I do in that one hour. And that one hour that I engage with my, my students every day of the week, it is is a, a, an affirmation of any measure of success that my my have might have acquired in my life. Yeah? Parallel to that is what I was uh, also suggesting is that how I prepared myself for that hour. You know that is very important. Mm -hmm. And I think this journey that we uh, engage with ourselves, that we engage within, mm -hmm. is also extremely important. I think it comes uh, primarily from how much value you give to yourself. Uh, I think it's very important for human beings to learn to value themselves, uh, value their thoughts, value their, um, um, their own ethical standards, uh, value their relationships with other people, value their relationships with the environment, value their relationships with their children, with their spouses, with their elders, value their relationships with the community, with society. And in my instance, in my case, of course, value your relationship with knowledge, value your relationship with wisdom. So uh, we are constituted by so many things. You know? mm -hmm. And I think uh, for me, it's very important to give value sure. uh, to those various interactions and relationships. And in this, in, in a sort of, in a cumulative sense, uh, those little, little instances of importance that you give to those little, little things in your life, I think ultimately contribute to who you become. So I think that process is also being, perhaps we'll talk more about it when right. you ask me more specific questions. Sure. So, uh, so you know, what but that process has got you to that success. Right. Yeah. Tell us a little about uh, 
how do you prepare for this one hour of uh, you know not only everyday classroom session uh, but also how you connect with your audience uh, you know in the students a very very good question actually <laughs> I mean, the, to the outline, you know the book, this book, yeah? That uh, you need to put in 10,000 hours of practice into you become a master. And I, I did a mathematics, I think about eight to 10 years back, I had put in 10,000 hours of teaching. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> so I'd done the calculation, back of the envelope calculation. So probably 10 years back, I achieved that 10,000 years of hours of practice. So uh, some of it is that. Some of it is downright dedication, hard work, which is preparing, knowing your subject well, putting in those hours, you know, thinking through your lecture. You see, uh, uh, for a teacher, the, the one hour that you spent within the classroom is extremely performative. It's like a role you perform within the classroom. And like any actor will tell you or anybody, any, any performer will tell you, whether you're a sports person or a, or a theater artist, that a lot of preparation and rehearsals and mind work goes into that one hour. So, so I think what is very important is that in every line of work, real success, hard work, so that a 10,000 hour rule as enunciated the academic profession, if not more so. So a lot of hard work. The second thing you asked was about connecting with students. I think uh, uh, Daniel Goldman's uh, Emotional intelligence tells you about the importance of empathy. Uh, empathy means being able to uh, put yourself in the other person's shoes. So I think one of the things that makes a teacher a good teacher is uh, for her or him to have this ability to empathize. And the ability to empathize has a certain component in it, which for me is extremely important. <clears throat> and that is the desire to share. To, to really be extremely excited about sharing an idea and then also holding hands with somebody and getting her or him across the Rubicon, as it were, across the threshold, as it were, into through the complexity of that idea. You know, so, I mean, when you're a student in a, in, a, in a university, you're dealing with complex ideas and it takes a lot, a lot of thinking, a lot of uh, stepwise intellectual labor to get from point A to B. Mm -hmm. sure. So unless a teacher is able to engage with an intensity that helps uh, the student uh, traverse from point A to B, these stepwise traversing, uh, uh, real learning doesn't happen. And that kind of involvement mm -hmm. in stepping into the other person's shoes can only happen with sufficient empathy. Of course, there's a lot more to it. There's a lot of jazz, you know, how you hold your class, your presence in the classroom, your ability to connect with people, eye movements, how you sort of scan the entire class. You catch everybody's eyes every 30 seconds. That's not happening now with online teaching. But within the classroom, I have a rule. If I haven't met somebody's eyes in 30 seconds, the entire class, then I'm losing the class. So I have to sort of scan myself left, right, left, right, left, right. Gauge boredom, crack a joke getting too heavy, lighten up, uh, people sleeping, raise your voice, mm -hmm. change the tone of your voice. So these are theatrical external aspects to teaching. So, and that also, I think, and, and crack good jokes, not dad jokes all the time, you also crack jokes that young people have fun with. And also, I think <clears throat> the last thing is uh, that the examples that you take or you, you sort of build to, to establish, say, an idea, should be examples that they relate to. Right? You should be sort of be able to take examples from everyday life, things that are important and that to matter to them. I think it's very important to not sit on a high horse just because you are intellectually superior or you are sort of positionally superior because you're a professor and they're students. So I think it's important to cut through that distance. Because see, knowledge cannot happen in an, a true exchange of knowledge cannot happen in an atmosphere of uh, subservience. Mm -hmm. So whereas they are sort of respectful towards their teachers and there's this mariada of, you know, of the Guru, Shishya, Parampara and all that in India, that's all fine. Mm -hmm. But for really real intellectual inquiry to happen, they have to sort of 
measure up and, and sort of ask me questions uh, as person to person. And for that, there has to be a certain leveling. I mean, too much uh, hierarchy, I think, is inimical to uh, fair exchange of and uh, optimal exchange of knowledge. And I think that's also something I promote. There's a certain friendliness, there's a certain openness, there's a certain liberal uh, atmosphere that I foster within the classroom, which I think also helps students connect with me better. Yeah. Beautiful. So, you know, like uh, knowledge cannot happen in subservience, you know, like uh, this is this is very well said yeah. because we need to come down to the level of the students to really connect and uh, have a very smooth transfer of knowledge. Um, you know, what I'm also kind of I would like to touch upon is that not a lot of brilliant students actually go into teaching. Right. Uh, whereas that's one of the most important and noble professions of all times, right, from our uh, Gurukul system, maybe, you know, in ancient times, right. Uh, what do you think in society has really impacted this desire to be in academics or to be a professor, teacher, mentor, you know, what has really changed that path? Mm -hmm. First, I'll address the first question that you, yeah. first part of your question, which is that uh, the best students don't be, end up becoming teachers. Actually, you are partially correct, mm -hmm. but not entirely. Okay. There are certain disciplines where the best of students only mm -hmm. end up becoming teachers. So, if you look at the social sciences and humanities, mm -hmm. the best scholars social science man. So the best historian in the class will end up becoming a history professor. Okay. Only the best can. But if you see the best law student in the class, mm -hmm. she won't become a law teacher. Mm -hmm. The best engineering student won't become an engineering professor. You go on to do something much more fancy. Right. Same with the CA, same with the BCom honor students, etc. Right. And if you're top of the class in SRCC BCom, you're going to get a 60 uh, lakh uh, CTC job as soon as you finish graduation from mm. Sri Ram College of Commerce, Delhi University. Mm. You never even, you won't even ever have the chance of entertaining thought of becoming a teacher. <laughs> right. So ironically, therefore, you will find uh, oftentimes mm. that if you look at the university system, it's the liberal arts who have the best teachers, ironically. No, because and, the, and perhaps... The number and of perhaps this maybe are a little limited in uh, liberal arts. Not just that, not just a that actually nowadays they are not. Mm -hmm. They are not. I'm talking about the best students, the best students of uh, departments which have, say, a professional, direct professional outreach, tend to find their uh, place in life very early. Whereas the liberal arts uh, uh, students who are very bright tend to continue with their studies. Mm -hmm. So they'll at least take an MA. I mean, if you do a, your BCom from SRCC, you might not do an MCom. And how many BCom students end up doing MCom? They don't need to, or they do. They get into other kinds of specializations. They do an MBA. They do a chartered accountancy. They do a cost accountancy. Mm -hmm. But if you if you've done history honors, mm -hmm. you inevitably get into MA history, mm -hmm. and then you might sort of get drawn to doing your MPhil or PhD or scholarship. So it's likely that a good student in one of these liberal arts and humanities, social sciences, they, they stick with their academics a little longer because there are lesser opportunities to branch out at a lower level. It's a very, it's a very practical arrangement. I'm not, it's not a value loaded arrangement. I'm not saying one is better than the other. It's just because of circumstances. So therefore faculty, social scientists sometimes are better in quality than some of the other disciplines. But like you said, why teaching? Huh? See, for me, it was a very simple process. Uh, I had various opportunities to choose a career. Uh, I was post journalist as, a, uh, as an executive with the Tata Group, uh, UPSC. So I, I, I took some of these exams. I cleared them also, and yet I chose to teach. So I did a very interesting exercise with myself. I don't know if people do this. And this is the advice I give to many of my students when they ask me that I'm unsure of what, what I'm going to do with my life. Mm -hmm. So I said, look, let's set the profession aside. Mm -hmm. I went and sat myself down uh, in the ridge, which is like a, almost like a forest area. You have this in Delhi, you have this 
forests within the city. Mm-hmm. And I took a bench and I sat there for two, three hours. Mm-hmm. And then I did a bit of introspection. Mm-hmm. And I thought to myself, okay, let's project myself to the age of 40. Mm-hmm. How do I imagine myself? So I did this thought exercise, which is called a projection exercise. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, uh, you, there are many, there are many definitions for this, mm-hmm. but let's just simply put it this way that I sat, projected myself to the future. Okay? Mm-hmm. I visualized, that's the word actually right. many people use. I right. visualized my future mm-hmm. and I said, what am I doing? Mm-hmm. What is my family like? Mm-hmm. I have kids. What am I doing with the kids? What is my mind like? Mm-hmm. Who's my boss? Who are my subordinates? Who am I working with? Where am I working? Where all am I working? What are the pressures on me? Mm. And then I ask myself these six or seven or eight questions. And then I imagine myself to be in a job and ask those questions and answer those questions. All imagine it. Then B job, those are three or four opportunities available to me at the time. Mm. So I ran myself through each of those possibilities. And I'll tell you very, very, very simply put, Every time I ask those questions of myself as a future teacher at 40 years age, mm. the answers look very comfortable to me. I felt very happy. I said, gosh, this is what I want to do. Mm. So for me, it was a very carefully uh, thought out exercise. It wasn't just a, a spot decision. Mm. But I'll tell you one thing. Mm. Uh, in, in, in retrospect, I feel fully vindicated that I chose correctly. I mean, given this, given another lifetime to choose my profession, mm-hmm. I wouldn't have chosen another profession. I would have chosen to be a teacher. I'll choose to be a teacher every time if I have to live my life again and again and again and again. Every version of my life that I can imagine will have me as a teacher, no other version. So there's no regrets. And I, and I chose very uh, specifically to be a teacher and happy that I'm doing exactly that. This is the best I could be. And this is the best time. I, this, this is what I am actually, I believe, good at. Right. And, 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 it, and it happens to be my passion and it continues to be my passion. And, and that, I think, is, is something one has, one is actually very, very grateful mm. for, you know, to be able to do what you're passionate about right. and to find interest in your work every time you, that one hour I told you when I hold those classes, I feel absolutely alive and I think I'm in my zone. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Brilliant. So, um, you know, like uh, in Finland, incidentally, uh, teachers are not only very we- uh, well paid, they, they are also held at the highest esteem, you know, amongst all the other professions. Unfortunately, in India, I think, you know, like, uh, we are still to mature to that level where teachers become, you know, uh, to to uh, that priority level where we jump into that profession and make good use of that. All right, great. So you know, you made this. No, but I want to. I want to. Yeah. I want to say something. Yeah, yeah. Please. I mean, your your formulation begs the question. I mean, why is it so? I mean, I'm familiar I, with the so educational actually, yeah, system of. Would love to it's a great you. question, actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because see, uh, firstly, Scandinavia invests hugely in education. Sure, it's free, including university education is free. Norway is fully free. Finland is fully free. Sweden higher education is free for Swedes. Now mm-hmm. they've begun to charge a little bit for foreign students. They have some brilliant universities, and most universities there are free, and they're hugely liberal. Mm-hmm. I mean, if there are couples who go there and uh, if the woman becomes pregnant while they're doing their PhD, they get university because university PhD students are like employees. So they get all the employee benefits. So for two or three years, the state looks after them while they nurture the baby. Then they come back to finish their PhD, by which time eight years have passed. Once eight years have passed, you can claim your citizenship. So there, by the time your PhD, you've got your citizenship also and you're part of their academic system. Exactly. They're that liberal. Okay. So the value education. But what's interesting is this. Mm. Their greatest investment is in nursery education. And then it scales down as you go up the ladder. Mm. So the highest investment is at the nursery. In Finland, 
almost all people who teach at the nursery level are PhDs in education. And they are among the most highly paid members of society. The basic idea is that yeah. every nursery kid is a potential citizen. Mm. Mm. So if you invest in a kid at the nursery level, right. okay, you are actually building your society. So they take this business of citizenship very, very seriously. So every individual who is a member of that society who is a mm -hmm. in the making mm -hmm. is, 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 is a potential that has to be nurtured at, at its very inception. Mm -hmm. So all their, their basic thinking, and even if you look at their school curriculum, they're thinking of all kinds of stuff. I mean, experiential learning is just a very low category of evolution when you come to Finland. I mean, they are into much more advanced things. They are into, in fact, their whole leveling thing is also they think of changing. Why should all class six kids read the same stuff? You know, mm -hmm. uh, someone may be a basic musician in class six. Eh? Someone in class ten may be just learning the guitar. Right. So she, she'll be in class two music class. Somebody in class four may be a prodigy in piano. So she should be in the class. <laughs> So when it comes to musicians and sports persons, you don't classify them into seniority. True. It's not because you've played badminton for four years that all badminton players, and you've been a badminton player yourself, all players who've played badminton for four years are not categorized as one category, are they? Not, not at it all. It depends on your level. Absolutely. It depends on your level. And if you're that good and you want to train and there are no girls around, you'll be playing with boys. Which I always so they do. are now looking at education. So this, yeah, exactly. So this, this banding together mm. of unequals is itself very detrimental to growth, academic mm. growth. So they are rethinking that also. So they are rethinking the entire business of classrooms. Right. Why class five, class six, class seven? You have people doing intermingling things. Uh, for maths, I go to class eight. For English, I go to class 12. For science, I go to class four. <laughs> like that and all kinds of experimentation so uh, so like you said finland uh, education we uh, are a long 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 away way away from that i think uh, in india i think we need to really learn how to value human beings you know maybe there are too many of us but that shouldn't be a deterrent i think our entire philosophy and pedagogical philosophy philosophy of the classroom has to change hugely we right. just we don't we don't really respect we have a lot of respect for what education can do mm. but we don't have a lot of respect for education per se we are we only respect education because it can get us to an iit we don't really respect the education of the iit right. we respect iit because iit is the catapult to the us we don't really respect an indian institute of management we we know we respect iima because you know it's a catapult to a 70 lakh mm. Package. rupees per annum job so so academics i mean even parents they're rushing their children to quota for a math tuition for science tuition not because we really respect knowledge or what education can do for the kid or things. it's just it's just a means to competition so so education is a fast track on 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 the in the rat race basically so the, everybody's in this rat race and the, and the fast lane belongs to those who get good education so I think this philosophy has to change. I think uh, true discoveries, true knowledge, true fun frontiers of knowledge are breached by those who are interested in knowledge. And, and let me tell you, uh, there is something called the knowledge economy. Mm -hmm. and, and we are ultimately what we are training our children to become. And what we are good at is we are good as consumers of knowledge. Right. We are not producers of knowledge. The producers of knowledge still happen to be the richer countries, of which America is the number one producer of knowledge, not China. China still, and as long as you are a consumer of knowledge, you will be at the bottom of the knowledge pyramid in the global economy. Only when you become a producer of knowledge will you be at the top of that pyramid. So you can be smart, you can be rich, your GDP can go up and whatever else can happen, but you'll be just chasing knowledge that is produced by somebody else. To produce knowledge, you have to have love of knowledge and not just the ability to acquire knowledge efficiently. So I think this whole knowledge economy also needs to be understood uh, 
properly. I think it's not understood properly. And I, as an educator, uh, I think about it a lot uh, and it worries me, it troubles me. And it's something that I invest a lot of my thinking uh, in. So I, I hope India someday uh, has some, uh, you know, like, uh, what should I say, people or create a kind of crack team to transform this entire element the way it's going. And uh, we get to follow some of the best of nations who are already, you know, practicing some of this. Uh, so, you know, like another thing is that everyone, like you said, is in the rat race and everyone thinks that okay, success is defined by the score, by certain parameters. Which external, are... parameter, external parameters. Right, right. So- And how... also, also these are parameters that you allow other people to set for you. Right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. success is, is you are measuring your own success vis-a-vis -vis parameters that are set by somebody else. Somebody else, absolutely. And those parameters may not be at all relevant to you. Right. Yeah. So how do we change this and how do we bring about, uh, you know, like citizens and uh, professionals who start looking at it differently? And what's your perspective in terms of success? Yeah, I think, I think this is a cultural issue also. Uh, I don't know what it is, but uh, I think Tagore also mentions it uh, in, 19, in 1912, Tagore went and uh, spent a lot of time in England. And after uh, interacting with many English poets and English thinkers and intellectuals, and he said that he discerned something fundamental, uh, which he defined. And he says, and I'm paraphrasing, I don't remember the exact quote. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He said that in, in England, the public culture is very vigorous, very questioning, mm. you know, because people live uh, uh, in a public, domain right uh, and, and and public uh, discourse as it were is extremely challenging so everybody is engaging in the external world by asking questions answering questions very vigorous and very questioning mm -hmm. he says often in india we live in very tight communities huh? at mm -hmm. least at that time i mean that go early 19th century early 20th century so he says, we live within very tight communities, you know, whether it's community defined by your caste, mm -hmm. uh, community defined by your class, community defined by your linguistic background or extended families to begin with, right. the joint family setup. So he says, within such a homogeneous group of people, mm -hmm. we don't have an aggressive public culture. But you ask questions about things, you ask questions about your belief systems, your values, etc., etc., etc. So for me, uh, that becomes a problem because see, when you talk about education, uh, we are obviously very smart people because we do well in academics by and large. Our math science skills are good. Uh, for one thing, Indians who go overseas are extremely successful. I mean, the same people who don't seem to be able to flourish in India go outside and they, they are champions overseas. So yes, the first question that you ask is this, I mean, what is it about the environment outside that allows them to find themselves, which they cannot find themselves staying uh, in their native country? I mean, when they go out of India, they're extremely successful. Had they remained in India, they might not have become as successful as they have become after going overseas. So the first question to ask is, there is there something wrong in our society arrangement and thinking? And I think I'm trying to fit what Tagore said, the question that Tagore asked, I'm trying to fit into our milieu. I think we aren't questioning enough. Uh, we have too much hierarchy. We have too much categorization. Uh, we, 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 we are uncomfortable with asking uncomfortable questions. And I think uh, genius emerges by asking uncomfortable questions. I mean, George Bernard Shaw once said mm -hmm. that, you know, the rational man adapts himself to society. Mm -hmm. The irrational man expects society to adapt to him. Mm -hmm. Therefore, he says, all progress is dependent on the irrational. Man. irrational. But we are too busy trying to be rational, trying to fit into, trying to fit our minds, our thoughts, our our, our, our aspirations to societal expectations, to community expectations, to even the political expectations of our world around. I think we aren't rebellious enough or radical enough in the fundamental sense. So just piercing your 
gears and wearing fancy uh, you know signages on your t-shirt doesn't make you radical right? radical means being fundamentally able to challenge gandhi was radical uh, rabindra tagore was radical they were radical people and right. they were they were very they are, they are viewed as saint like holy people you know? but fundamentally they were extremely radical gandhi and tagore both asked very searching questions of society so i think that kind of radicalism which is constructive radicalism which is fundamental questioning i think that needs to become part of our ecosystem you know? mm -hmm. whether in the corporate world or in the academic world or in governance or in politics i think this ability to ask these fundamentally reshaping kind of questions challenging questions is i think uh, going to have to become the imperative for india for the kind of success uh, that this country deserves because we are full of bright people it's a great country we make our way through chaos every day dealing with chaos is our biggest learning we are endowed with natural resources this uh, and our genius is thousands of years old there's nothing that should have could stop us i mean ancient societies like japan china they found themselves you know the asian countries that have found themselves so i think uh, somewhere down the line you know uh, we also need to find ourselves in that fundamental sense and for that i think uh, i think societal imperatives need to change and that maps in with education education learning knowledge uh, can only do so much if there are social constraints to uh, your self realization there are social constraints to the kind of success that you can achieve through your abilities and talents and uh, attributes so i think that it's it's a kind of it's much more than just education yeah. right so where do we start where does it all begin inside i think it can begin inside of the i think it's important well it has to begin within the classroom but the fundamental thing is to ask questions i think it's not so difficult Mm -hmm. see there is something called justice and injustice i think all human beings have an inherent sense of justice and injustice so even if you see your mother or sister mm -hmm. being treated as a second class citizen within the household mm -hmm. as a person you can ask a feminist question you don't need to read feminism to ask that question true <laughs> so 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 and if a, if a, if a, if a dog is being beaten up on the streets you don't have to be an animal rights activist to object to it you don't have to have an intellectual fundamental intellectual background or position to intervene i think the ability to intervene is there in every human being i think our social constraints are so strong you know our caste constraints are so strong uh, our uh, religious leanings are so strong our faith is so strong our idea of the nation for example is so binding on us that sometimes we are impeded from asking fundamental questions i think that's the start the start has to happen by asking questions i mean like i tell my students a good teacher is somebody who has all the right answers mm. so 30 years back the good teachers day was over because once google came and in the internet came you don't need a good teacher anymore because all the information is available at the tip of your mm. fingers literally on your phone right the next level of teacher the great teacher is the teacher who asks the right questions because now the student has to go and ask for the right answers there are answers are all there but you need to be able to ask the right questions but i tell them the greatest of all teachers the ideal teacher is somebody who who motivates you guides you trains you to ask the right questions mm. because if you are dependent on the teacher to, for asking the questions after 3 years out of college absolutely who'll ask the questions then mm. but if you are trained to ask questions you will ask questions lifelong so when you invent something uh, in the research floor of your company right. when you crack Uh, 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 an opening during a business negotiation yeah. when you when you come up with a sales pitch for your marketing uh, uh, marketing plan for a new product launch yeah. the person who's there who has the courage to ask questions on the right kind of question the difficult kind of question the parameters what do you call that that 
that get out of the box question yeah is someone who's most likely to find the answer that clicks so this training of asking questions we are not a very questioning nation we accept what others say you know even within your mother will tell you oh don't don't ask too many questions in your sasural adjust you know little bit compromise little bit adjustment is good <laughs> students will come back and say teacher you know it's not it's okay she's your teacher elders ko respect karte hain and yeah, just chill in the classroom i think our basic training is to be a little bit uh, uh, restrictive and and and, and reticent about asking difficult questions i think it's not a bad idea to ask difficult questions mm. uh, in other societies they have it people actually ask the question even if it gives discomfort even if it displeases if you have a question ask it i think that culture is very important and in modern nations that are successful individuals who are successful mm. are nations or individuals who have the courage to ask questions i think so this this paradigm for me is very important the yeah. questioning paradigm what i call it yeah true yeah from our uh, school days we have always to keep quiet listen to the lecture yeah. and replicate yeah. and go and write <laughs> the answers that's that's the yeah. you know that's what has spoiled the entire nation or or or, or it is eulogized yeah oh yeah. she's a very obedient child obedient child yeah every your teeth might my in my ptms my, mm. my the, the my children's teacher used to tell us like oh he's a very obedient child mm. uh, and in my mind i would say I, i would hope not i mean i mean i don't want an obedient child i want a questioning child true 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 so uh, you know what are uh, so you know like uh, we went through success we went through some of the changes which should uh, come in india so that you know we become uh, the next most powerful nation in the world why not we have all the potential we have all the manpower we have all the knowledge that is required yet you know we have to step into that hour of uh, kind of bringing in the questions which would transform our uh, trajectory so what are the behaviors or traits that can uh, that has helped you and that can help uh, youngsters and professionals to really kind of uh, achieve this goal in life no i think two or three things are very important and, and I, i have no mantra you know every human subject is different every personality is different and in terms of uh, i mean i can't really prescribe to somebody else to be somebody you know i can't but i can share the kind of person i am and to the extent that i feel uh, uh, some of these character traits have helped make me who i am one is mindfulness i'm extremely mindful of the smallest thing huh? i'm a great and very very keen observer of the littlest of things i'm extremely curious about processes every very very curious about everything sometimes things that are completely peripheral to my uh, own existence and have absolutely no bearing on anything that i do or think or eat or sleep or drink but i'm still interested um, for example i don't even use facebook to socialize i use facebook to watch videos on carpentry videos on food or videos on geography videos and any you know, it's a fantastic resource for uh, you know generally having fun exploring all kinds of weird uh, things and and knowledge systems mm. so i'm very curious that so mindfulness mm -hmm. and curiosity and observation skills mm. okay these are three basic uh, traits that i can think of and i think it is because of these traits this is because of essentially such a nature mm -hmm. that uh, i have and i said this truthfully to to you right at the beginning that i actually never get bored mm. i mean i can stand in in a queue for 3 hours not be bored i'll observe people and i'll think of this and that i'll read a book in my mind or i'll write a book in my mind uh, there is i mean every moment 
is an experience because I'm looking forward to everything. I'm looking forward to dinner. I'm looking forward to washing the dishes after dinner. I'm looking forward to cooking. I'm looking forward to going out to the balcony and watering the plants. I want to see how the breeze, how the leaves are fluttering in the breeze. Today, if there's a breeze, then I'm excited to see how the fluttering of the breeze of the leaves in the breeze will happen. I, I don't know what the skies will look like in the evening. Mm. If the day is clear, I know. And if there's some speckled clouds, I know in the sunset, they'll catch a shade of orange and look magnificent. Maybe I'll take a photograph. So every little moment in life holds a lot of promise and expectations for me. And, and, and there is something to learn, something to investigate in these uh, slices of life that I encounter every day. So even my everyday simple life uh, minus a fancy holiday to Goa mm -hmm. or a holiday to Southeast Asia or a long drive which is all very exciting which is something that our family loves to do and which I do all the time my wife and children and I we are great travelers we are great foodies all that is fine all those excitement is there but even otherwise every moment of existence for me is is is, is a is a thing and therefore, that's my... Enthusiastic all the time, whether you're cooking, whether you're driving, whether you're gardening or, you know, like uh, even talking and yeah. saying something that happened yeah. during your day. So I, I was actually yeah. wondering, how do you keep this enthusiasm level right from morning, you know, whatever time you get up? And I've seen you do that uh, till 10 o'clock when you retire to bed. So... How do you achieve this uh, level of uh, energy throughout the day? Because, because I don't feel guilty about being lazy. Mm. So when I actually put up my foot, put up my feet, and I watch something on TV or or or, or Netflix, mm. or when I just sit down somewhere quietly and read a book, or when I retreat and I'm not doing anything, mm. I enjoy that as well. Most people are guilty about not being active, which is why when they're actually active, they don't have the enthusiasm to be active. Right. So the first thing is don't be guilty about laziness. Don't be guilty about your me time. Don't be, or, or what they call is downtime. You know, in a machine, you have something called downtime and the machine is not working. Your father was an engineer, so you would know. Mm -hmm. the downtime means when an engineer. So all human beings have downtime. But we live in a, such a complex world that we are all very, very guilty about our downtime. Right. We feel we are wasting time. We are not being productive. We said we should get up. And sometimes we don't want to get up. We are lazy and we don't get up. And we guilt even more. Because yeah. we know we should get up and we don't get up. I don't have any such problem. When I chill, I chill. Fundamentally chill. I can switch off completely. So I enjoy silence also. Yeah. So it's not that I'm fundamentally hyper. When I'm quiet and I'm not doing anything, when I, if I can take to the bed in the afternoon for a 20 minute nap, I'm totally happy. I'm happy not to do anything, but I'm also happy to do everything. Wow. So for me, so for me, being highly energetic is also not a thing. For me, being into whatever I am at any moment, point in time, is the thing. If I'm lazy, I will laze happily. By doing something, I'll do that happily. I do everything I do with full enthusiasm, which is why I enjoy doing my things. And therefore, it's not a thing. Right. The energy is not really a manifestation of hyperness, you know, which is what many people think about me. That I'm very hyper because I appear very hyper. But it's not that. It's enjoyment mm -hmm. in everything I do. Beautiful. That way, I'm not a religious person, so I don't, uh, I can't say this is a state of bliss or some nonsense like that. I don't believe in all that. But but you could, for those yeah. who are believers, you could say that it's almost like a, a, a state of bliss. All the time. And I don't get angry. I don't get yeah. upset too much. I, mm -hmm. I have a fair balance as a human being. I think that's also very important to be able to be functional. Because you know? if you get too negative in your head, mm -hmm. then you don't become optimally functional. Absolutely. I think excessive anger mm. or even in the office, you know, there's something unfair happens in the office and then you sort of start burning within and then 
then you then you are then you get disengaged from your work from your office from your colleagues and then you 100% doesn't get into it so then you have those bad days in office and everything gets messy and you come back feeling bad and then your spouse has to take some of the punches because you're feeling bad because of a bad day in office so everything gets screwed up yeah. so therefore just be in your zone do your thing enjoy that everything that you do I'm doing more work than the person next door. The boss has given me four extra fives. Enjoy doing those five. Do it well. In any case, Pareto principle, 80% of the people in an office do, 20% uh, of the people in an office do 80% of the work anyway. So don't crave about doing more work. You're doing more work because you're efficient. Feel good about it. Give yourself a, a slap on the back. Just do it. Cover up for other people's inefficiencies. Don't point it out. So shit, that person gets the same salary as I do. Just feel this way. You deserve your salary. That person doesn't. So feel grateful that you are good enough to deserve your salary. That's it. Just keep the negatives out. Do your thing. Be in your zone. Keep your life interested and keep your life interesting. Don't worry about the others. Things go wrong. Shit happens. Let it be in its place. Don't, don't have to smell it. Though. Okay? So what's been the greatest achievement when you look back, you, you spoke about uh, this vision of coming into teaching and you've done it. Um, you are kind of living your life every moment, uh, which is fantastic. And which is this moment of achievement, which when you look back, you say, okay, this has been the remarkable, uh, remarkable one, which really makes you feel good. I, I, it's difficult for me to point out one thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, there are those measurable instances of my uh, career with studies. Uh, I was I joined a college called Hansraj College. Mm -hmm. I joined it just like that. Mm -hmm. St. Stephen's had a saint in it. Mm -hmm. The college across the road was called Hindu College. So I didn't want a saint mm -hmm. a prefixed college. Mm -hmm. I didn't want Hindu College. So I asked them, what's the third college? This is Hansraj College. I said, I went to Hansraj. No expectations. Mm. But uh, uh, subsequently, I was the first person to get a first class in English from Hansraj College. Nobody before me had got a first class in English. So they were kind of beholden to me. Then I did well in my MA and I got started teaching there. Mm. And then there have been these instances of recognition, uh, both from the university as an outstanding teacher and then was featured in Times of India, this September 5th dedications you know three four times whenever they've published it you know popular teachers of Delhi University so there are these some external marks of uh, recognition but uh, they are kind of unimportant I think what is more important is the, is is to see my students you know more than my and that's the beauty of a teacher I mean it's not so much my own success, but to see my students successful. You know? mm -hmm. uh, when I know somebody is in the Indian Foreign Services and is posted in Paris and writes me a note, somebody is doing her PhD from Chicago University in anthropology, English student who's doing anthropology, writes me a note. Somebody who's done his PhD from Cambridge and is a photographer and is archiving, uh, doing a history of Shimla. Mm -hmm. uh, I, 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 that's some student who's a science student, but who took a echo from me and because I taught her English someday and she's in Heidelberg doing her postdoctoral work. Mm -hmm. She writes to me. So with my students all over the world doing studies, doing, making films, many of them are filmmakers, wow. some of them are actors, wow. uh, all kinds, and then all kinds. One of them is one of the guys in a Kapil Sharma show. He was in, he was in my college a long time back. Wow. One of those guys, one of those characters. I mean, even there, you know, actors, uh, theater personalities, movie makers, PhDs. So when these students, mm. these students get back and, and they, they that love and uh, perhaps a little bit of regard, but mostly love and, and recognition of what I have, uh, the role that I have played in their life. I think that is the real mark of my success. The real mark of my success is not any one point in my own career graph, mm. but uh, uh, but the success that has been enjoyed by the students who have done. I think they are their success is the true mark of my success, rather than any success of my own. I mean, that's that's the way I look at it. Yeah, that's how I measure. If I ever have to, I would never like to measure success because I don't think it's a quantifiable thing. Success is a very qualitative thing. But if I were to ever measure it, 
it would be in terms of the success of my students rather than myself. Awesome. So this is more like yeah. being a catalyst of, uh, you know, kind of uh, what they have the done. Chemistry, yeah. total chemistry lab reagent. Yeah, yeah, awesome. And and has there been a failure ever, a moment uh, which has kind of broken you, a moment where, uh, you know, and how do you make comeback from those kind of situations? Failure lots, mm. various stages, personal life, early life, uh, uh, losing a year in academics as well, lots of things. Mm. So like my grandfather, is your grandfather as well said, mm. once wrote to his son who had uh, not done well in his BSc mm. and had written to him that that son, remember that failure uh, failure is the stepping stone to success, but successive failures are not successive stepping stones to success. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, so, I, <laughs> yeah. so, 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 so lots of failures. I think uh, we fail all the time. I think we fail every day. We fail in big things. We fail in small things. It's just that it's, you shouldn't let failure define you. Right? Mm -hmm. Look, you only learn from your own experiences. We give lots of gyan to our children. Yeah. It's, it's useless. Mm -hmm. because nobody can learn from other people's mistakes. They'll make their mistakes and only then will they learn. They failure to. is an opportunity to make mistakes. You, you see, failure is an indication of you having made a mistake. Mm. You having made a mistake is a path to awareness and wisdom. So I think you should celebrate your failures because you learn so much more from your failures than you ever will do from success. Success goes to the head. Mm. Success leads to a box of chocolates. Mm. Success mm. comes with a bunch of flowers. Mm. Success comes with a lot of talis. Nothing. It just massages your ego. There's nothing else for your personality. But failure... Failure is like being sucked into the ocean. Right? And that's when you need to fight to survive. So, I think. so failure is good. I love failures. And I fail all the time. Great. So, <laughs> uh, fantastic. Rajada, thank you so much uh, for making yeah. time. And uh, it was okay. a brilliant experience having a literary genius like you. Um, 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 what should I say? My dear professor, I would I would call you a my dear professor. I would love to, you know, be a student of yours. I wish uh, in my next life I am. And this life, this life. All, while online life. classes are on, you join one class. Absolutely, absolutely. Because every time I talk to you, I personally feel very uh, motivated and inspired because you just have that energy which you transfer in every conversation you have had with anybody, I guess. So, you know, it's fantastic. So what's your part you. success mantra message uh, to our audience? I would say if you, if you think you're, you're bored, uh, you're not looking after yourself well enough. Mm. I think we need to look after ourselves more. We're very precious. You have to consider yourself very, very precious. And you need to look after yourself. Well, I think self-nurture is very, very important, especially for people who achieve probably some measure of success in life, or get somewhere in life. I think it's very important to look after yourself. I mean, no success is worth it if you don't have time to look after yourself. By look after yourself, I mean give time to your mind, to your thoughts, to your abilities. And sometimes you get stuck in the rut you stuck, get stuck into one kind of thinking. That's not just looking after yourself well enough. I think uh, for me, uh, success is important, but never at the cost of uh, looking after yourself well enough. And like I said, if you can practice this, try not to get bored. Mm -hmm. I think one of the measures of who you can become is to overcome boredom. You know, I, I, it's true, I, I really don't ever get bored. I don't. I mean, I, I have so much to do in every 15 seconds of my life that 
I don't have the time to do those things. And they may be nothing, you know. They may be just sitting quietly and feeling a cushion. Like if I if I lie down in a new bed, I love it because I want to experience every aspect of when I go to a hotel and I lie down in a mattress, I spend 10 minutes just enjoying the feel of that mattress, you know. And another 10 minutes looking out. And when I look out, I see these new sites, it's not a half an hour of enthrallment, you know. Mm-hmm. And then when I eat food, it's new food, it's another and one hour of enjoyment. You know? So every experience, every thing that you do, the next 15 seconds, whatever I'm going to do, if I'm going to go and make a cup of tea, I'm going to enjoy making that cup of tea, you know. I'm going to listen to the whistle of the kettle. I'm going to see how much time the kettle takes to switch on and off. Hmm? And I'm going to pour that uh, uh, hot water into the cup and I'll use the strainer and I'll see how the strainer soaks as I pour the water. I'll check the leaves, how the leaves transform once they're wet. It's something to notice in everything around you. And mind you, it contributes to who you become. Once you develop this habit of noticing small things, the kind of professionalism, the kind of expertise you bring to any job or profession that you're engaged in, is of another level altogether. So if you're an architect, you notice things that other people don't notice because you've got into the habit of noticing things. So therefore, when I talk about being aware, being aware, you know, what is called mindfulness. Mindfulness is no dharma thing. It's not about some spiritual state of being. It's about your everyday life. And I think mindfulness is extremely important, which is the the mantra, look after yourself and be very mindful. Uh, You'll be successful in every sense of the word. Beautiful. Thank you so much. So the biggest takeaway is look after yourself and be mindful. Engage yourself in every moment of life without getting bored. Yeah. Like they say, don't find, you don't have to find new hobbies new things to do, you know, get into some new spiritual practice. Oh, I want a change of scene, you know, I, I'm, I'm feeling oppressed here. That's all bullshit if you ask me, you know, I mean, that's a totally defeatist uh, way of looking at life and you need to change, you need a change of scene to become, no. You need to change yourself in that same scene to become. You don't need to change the scene. You need to change yourself. Problem is never out there. Yeah. Awesome, Radha. Thank you so much uh, for making time. Bye-bye.